Hey guys, as you can see behind me, lots of DC police still out here. I also want to show you the front of the zoo as I explain what's going on. The zoo is now closed, but people are still making their way outside. Zoo officials closed the zoo because of a stabbing that happened here just an hour or so ago. We know that a young teenage boy was taken to the hospital, stabbed once, is in very serious condition. The video you're looking at, we got when we were at the zoo here for African American Day. I was on the other side of the zoo, heard sirens, so we came rushing to the front of the zoo. Lots of people running around because of several fights that were going on inside of the zoo. You might have also seen pictures of that young man who was cuffed, handcuffed and being uh, walked around the zoo. Another fight broke out because of that guy. It looks like he has blood on his T-shirt, but at this point, we don't know how he was involved in all of this. Several fights have been reported. One mace incident, another person reporting saying they saw a gun inside someone's backpack here at the zoo. We tried to get in touch with zoo officials at this point. Haven't heard back from them. All we have confirmed, though, one teenage boy stabbed once here at the zoo at the hospital right now in serious condition. But anybody that lives around this area or in D.C. will remember it's been about 11 years ago on this very day at this very event, another violent incident about 11 years ago, several people shot here at the same event. Back to you guys. Sinead, I'm hearing a lot about these packages and even some letters here at Powell Elementary. We saw regular sized white envelopes being taken out by firefighters. Hearing a lot from the people who are trying to figure out where these packages and letters came from, that would be the FBI. And law enforcement sources say there are several common threads and several of these envelopes might be coming from the same place, but at this point, they don't want to say much because they have a lot of evidence, plenty of evidence to pour over as we're hearing now 20 schools receive these packages or letters. The other story right now is here at Powell Elementary. Parents are telling me it would have been nice to get a phone call from D.C. schools. Well, it's crazy. <laughs> One student was taken out on a stretcher. Two school employees were walked out the front door wearing oxygen masks. All after a suspicious package was found inside the main office at Powell Elementary School in Northwest D.C. Yeah, I was just a little worried about my daughter because I, when I saw all these uh, emergency vehicles, I was so scared. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. It started at noon. Police sources say a suspicious package found in the main office at Terrell Elementary School in Southeast D.C. Inside, a white powdery substance. I saw the you know, firefighter cars and ambulance, so I was really shocked what's going on. But after I came here and figured out, it's kind of scary, you know. Didn't know anything about it, so I, I got to go inside and see what's up. Many parents say they didn't receive a phone call from D.C. schools. Most found out when they arrived to pick up their children. I, I don't appreciate it. I don't know what's going Why they didn't call someone say something. As far as injuries go, you saw those three people there in the video checked out. We hear they're going to be okay. At this point, we haven't heard of any other injuries. Just hearing right now, 20 schools confirmed. Some of those schools cleared, like here at Powell Elementary School, where kids are right over here in the playground now. Everything's back to normal. Several others we're still waiting to hear about. It is going to be a long evening. I left my umbrella down. I've been outside of our car for about two minutes just to show you how much accumulation is happening here on my coat. The snow is really coming down. We're here at the Street Maintenance Center in Northeast D.C. Right here behind me, the trucks that have been coming in and out for the last several hours, loading up the salt, piling it into one of the dump trucks to get it out there on the roads. I just want to show you also how much snow we're getting down here below. If you look right here, I would say about three, three, four inches coming down. And we've seen this go from sleet. We've seen hail today around four o'clock all the way to snow. And it's finally sticking out here. But these trucks are going to be working all night long to try to keep things clear. We do want to mention here in D.C. We heard about two hours ago, D.C. public schools, a two hour delay. Students will go in two hours late to school. We'll keep you posted, though, if that changes. I talked to D.C. Mayor Vincent Gray. He says they're having a 5 a.m. meeting with his staff and the chancellor. They'll still decide if they need to make any other changes. But right now, a two hour delay and out here at the street maintenance site, things busy and we'll be even more busy as the night goes on. Back to you guys. Maureen, there is big concern about security out here at the Mark Center, and here's an example of why. This is our truck parked right here. Could be any truck just parked right here. And follow me, just steps away down the street. Here's the entrance to the Mark Center. 
Pentagon police guard the front checkpoints at the entrance to the Mark Center, the entrance to each parking lot, and you see officers patrolling the grounds in Alexandria. But what has some anti-terrorism experts concerned is just how close cars can get to the new Defense Department office complex. I think it's a reasonable criticism. Gates surround the entire Mark Center, but according to a new article in Time Magazine, the site has major vulnerabilities. In April, the project on government oversight warned in a private letter to then Defense Secretary Robert Gates about the Mark Center, noting that a truck bomb could easily be detonated in close proximity to the proposed new building, killing hundreds to thousands of DOD and contractor support employees. The Pentagon has not responded to the letter. Do you think that we should be able to get that close to the building? I think probably not. I don't think we're going to have that many issues with it. I mean, they say, I mean, the Pentagon's secure, but the metro still goes in there. Coupled with impending traffic this week, 6,000 people will be going to work at the Mark Center every day. The area is packed. All right, it's going to be very bad very soon. Alexandria leaders are also working on improving turn lanes, off ramps, and traffic signals soon to handle the crowds. I mean, you wait. There's going to be people fighting from Fredericksburg to go to D.C. and back and forth. Meantime, Congressman Jim Moran calling for a special hearing to discuss security concerns here at the Mark Center. Live from Alexandria, Natasha Barrett, ABC 7 News. Allison, I just spoke with the woman who says she was stuck inside her apartment during this fire. She says all she could do was cry and pray. And all I could then see was darkness. And I truly didn't know whether I was going to live or die. Loretta Battle is wearing the only clothes she owns now. She just got out of the hospital after firefighters rescued her from her third floor apartment in New Carrollton last night. She was holding her one and a half year old granddaughter. I held my grandbaby outside the window. At first I put a pillowcase over her face and she was gasping for breath so desperately. Nose running. Um, panting for breath, and all I could think of was to hold her out the window. Meantime, Ebony Brown was inside her apartment with her two children. Both of them could hear people yelling to get out. I grabbed my phone and my keys and just ran. 120 people lost their homes when firefighters say a heating and air conditioning system malfunctioned, causing the fire. Four apartment buildings at the Southern Walk Complex were destroyed, nearly $250,000 in damage. Battle's granddaughter was pulled from the fire first. And my intention wasn't to throw her, but if I had to, I think that I would have um, to save her life if I couldn't save mine. Through the thick smoke, firefighters found this two-month-old kitten gasping for air. Its name is Cora and belongs to six-year-old Michaela. I think it was nice for them to get, to get my cat. Such a good reunion there. Right now, everybody's okay. That was in that fire. Everyone that had to be rescued is doing okay. Everyone's accounted for. In the meantime, more than 100 people, close to 120 people, staying here at the Best Western in Lanham until they can find another place to stay. It is another long day. Pepco workers are out here behind me now working, but it took a lot to get them here. Neighbors have been without power since Saturday night, early Saturday night. And one neighbor said she called. Called Pepco today, and they told her they didn't have a report of her outing her entire block. So one neighbor decided to do something. Nah. It's a pain in the neck. Call it clever or more like an act of desperation. Whatever, if it works, it works. It got their attention. So people who live in Wesley Heights made these street signs guiding Pepco workers to their homes to restore power. Yeah, nothing yet still. Chuck Holsworth has to keep his food in this cooler so it won't go bad. This is my refrigerator and the back one is my freezer. You know, my food and milk and stuff and ice, I get ice twice a day. Here's the problem. This large tree fell on these power lines. Since Saturday, this tree has been dangling above the street. In St. Mary's County, Maryland, damage from the storm is extensive. Hundreds of huge trees came down, some on houses. Three homes have been condemned on one street. It's so bad that Governor Martin O'Malley stopped by. Right now, we don't know if they're going to be able to repair it. Back in D.C., neighbors are sharing this extension cord on Dexter Street. It was re literally right at the split. Um, we have power here, and right next door, they don't. 
The work continues out here in Northwest D.C. You see the Pepco workers here. They've removed that tree that we just showed you that was dangling above the street for the last couple of days. Now the hard work comes in. They actually have to fix these power lines. They're hoping to have power back on for these 30 people that live on this one street sometime tonight. Live from Northwest D.C., Natasha Barrett, ABC 7 News. Right, it's this is a great story, guys. Mike Holman found out he won the Powerball just three weeks before his ticket expired. Then he kept it from his entire family for almost two weeks until it was reality. Every time I purchase a ticket, I put it in the bag. The winning ticket was sitting in this grocery bag filled with old lottery tickets, hundreds of them. But Mike Holman never checked it. Well, why would you buy tickets and not check it? Because I wouldn't. I never had time. After the prodding of his mother, Holman checked the ticket at a convenience store. I gave it to the attendant, and he said that um, I can't do anything for you because we only can cash $600. But he didn't realize what he just won was worth a cool $200,000 cash. Hey, I said, no, you kidding me. You, you, and then on the same token, I was talking to her mom. My mom started to cry. I said, what are you crying for? Saying, sign a ticket. And I'm so emotional. Cold. I'm saying, wait a minute. And then my hand was shaking. And I was like, oh, my goodness. It was like, oh, man, you're nervous. I said, yes. <laughs> I, I can barely walk. He said, calm down. I said, okay, wait a minute. The 49-year-old retired Army veteran from Waldorf and father of six, was presented that big check yesterday. He knows just how he will spend his winnings. His credit card debt, $45,000, will be wiped away. And I'm going to help my daughter um, with her college, and then I'm going I'm to give all my family members some money, and I'm going to do a little bit more for Toys for Talk this year because I do it every year. Holman buys $100 worth of lottery tickets each week. But get this, the rest of those tickets in that plastic bag are still unchecked. You could be sitting on more money. Right, but I, I'll check them. Do you need help checking these? No. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. After taxes, Holman should get around $131,000. Now he says he picks his numbers from his family's birthdays, and he even went back to work yesterday at UPS. He says everyone treat him, treated him the same. <laughs> Pretty neat story. Leon? Where the protesters are set up for the last two months, actually, is very close to a lot of businesses, restaurants, stores, shops, and some people have asked, is it a conflict what's happening here? Through the cold and the rain, there's one place Occupy Wall Street protesters have sought shelter in. This Starbucks across the street from their compound on 15th and K Streets. It's hypocritical. It's very hypocritical. Melvin Gatling and Tim Thornton work nearby and describe their observations. And as we were walking across the street, he has a little laptop, he walks over to Starbucks, and I walked in with him, and he did get a cup of coffee, yes, we sat and talked for a little bit, and he, again, his whole argument is that government is too big, but yet you're in Starbucks drinking $5 coffee. It's estimated close to 100 or so protesters visit the store every day to use free Wi-Fi and organize protests online, and that, customers say, can mean waiting 20 minutes to use the restroom. But not all inside are technically customers. That's so preposterous. I don't think they just don't know what they're just young kids. They don't know what they're doing. Even Starbucks employees seem to have had their fill on the subject, physically blocking our camera today. You can't take pictures of Starbucks. Protesters who have been living near McPherson Square for two months defended their habits, and they say Starbucks employees have told them to leave if they're not buying anything. There's nothing necessarily wrong with the corporation. It's what it does with the money and the politicians that get bought out by them. And Starbucks does a lot of good. Like they have their charitable foundation. I, mean, I believe Starbucks is ridiculously overpriced and I don't like their buying policies with uh, coffee around the world. So no, but I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I get a f of coffee. I did reach out to Starbucks today. So far, though, haven't heard back from them.